All right, good morning, everybody. I hope everybody had a good sleep in. Um, so we're gonna get started with today's first session. We only have two speakers today because we had a cancellation. Um, but our first speaker is Soteria Farapalo, and I'll let her take it away. Perfect, thank you. Yeah, so today I would like to talk to you about classification from real and very, very messy data. Um, and this is the city center of Bristol, if you haven't had the chance to visit us yet, is really nice. Um, first, a little bit of context. Why am I doing all of the stuff I'm, I'm doing, right? So we have several big questions, and I'm sure this crowd will definitely agree. This is one of the largest questions we have in astronomy, right? The dark universe, what is going on, right? We, we don't see a lot of it. Um, my personal uh, very large question next to it is the impact of supermassive black holes in galaxy evolution. Um, we can discuss if you disagree with this uh, question being one of the most important ones, but uh, there we go. That's my personal uh, view on the subject. Uh, how do, are we going to address all of these things, right? We, we all know here we have a lot of very beautiful experiments coming up. Uh, photometry is going to dominate absolutely in terms of volume because we're expecting several billions of sources and this is a challenge even just storage wise, right? This is uh, a lot of data to, to shift through. Spectroscopy is going to be absolutely fantastic compared to what we have had up to now, but it's still very small compared to photometry in terms of, of number of sources we are going to observe. And clearly the extreme universe coming from the radio and the X-ray side uh, has a unique perspective on, on what is the physical mechanism that happens, especially in black holes. Uh, now, with all of these experiments, we are in position to, uh, to tackle these very big questions that I put in my previous slide. Of course, pinpointing the cosmological parameters with great accuracy will uh, rule out a lot of the competing models. Um, and I will tell you in particular about the Euclid mission and how we're going to, to do that. And at the same time, we're getting for free all of this beautiful data to actually answer questions about the, the black hole, um, population and especially in the high redshift universe. This is where we lack uh, data at the moment uh, in great numbers. And these missions, because they are very large area missions, will capture the rare sources, which includes the, the black holes. A few words about Euclid. We heard it being mentioned, or not mentioned, <laughs> in the past uh, weeks. Um, I just wanted to give you a summary of the mission. So this is a mission specifically designed to do cosmology. Everything from the telescope to the detectors and to the analysis of the data is tailored for cosmology. This is the footprint of the wide survey. Everything in green is going to be observed in the optical and near infrared with HST resolution. And this is 15,000 square degrees. So this is going to be absolutely spectacular. We are more than 2,000 people and counting, 17 countries involved in this mission, and it's absolutely spectacular and as scary as it sounds. Um, the resolution, in, we have two instruments, one optical and one infrared, VIS and NISP, but the resolution is, is amazing for both of them. Uh, and in addition, we are going quite deep. So what you have here is the depth in the near infrared uh, and the area of the sky that we're covering. Everything that's a black dot is an existing near-infrared uh, photometric survey from the ground. And Euclid is going to do uh, a huge uh, survey of the, the majority of the sky. This is what we call Euclid wide. This is what I showed in the footprint in the sky, in the, uh, the sky footprint in the slide before. The area of each circle is proportional to the size of the data set, right? So you can see that the wide survey is going to be spectacular compared to absolutely everything we have currently or planned. We also have a deep survey, which is about 60 square degrees, and these are chosen fields around the sky. I can go back and show you where they are. They're small in comparison. They're the yellow dots, right? But they are 60 square degrees, and they, they are going to be extremely deep, two magnitudes deeper compared to the wide survey. So you can expect a lot of beautiful data. We are looking into the high redshift, above redshift one, uh, with, with great accuracy. Now we are going to, to launch, Euclid is ready, this is it, this is the telescope, so theory for scale. Um, we are going to launch from Cape Canaveral. The uh, launch date will be announced in the next couple of weeks. I don't know, don't ask me, <laughs> they haven't told me. Maybe Francisco knows. Um, 
Uh, and yeah, I'm quite passionate about this mission. I've been working on it for the past decade of my life. So we can talk about all of the details if you want. So well, uh, currently what I'm doing in, in Euclid, I'm leading the classification working group for the photometric redshift uh, work package. And I will tell you the details in a second. And I'm also leading the, the AGM uh, work package, which relates to the legacy science of the mission. I didn't put it on the slide, but I'm coordinating the Euclid UK community as well. Now, something that is a little bit less known is the artwork that is going to fly on Euclid. You know, it's the morning, so I thought I would give you something more <laughs> light. So in the, the consortium meeting in 2019, we had uh, Lisa Pettibone was a, a resident artist at MSSL, which is the, the laboratory that created the visual instrument in the UK. Uh, and she came up with this idea for us to put our fingerprints uh, and create a galaxy. So this is what we did in one of our consortium meetings. This is real fingerprints of all of us, including mine. And um, Lisa went back and she made this, um, this very nice artwork out of what we put on the paper. And then there is a poem that was written specifically for that. Now this we call the fingerprint galaxy and you can go and see a video uh, about this. Um, and this was etched using the same uh, laser that was uh, that created the VIS instrument. So, you know, it <laughs> all ties uh, very well together. Uh, and this is it. <laughs> now, Euclid is large. So this, this is the, the galaxy that will fly on the payload. It's about yay big. <laughs> so that was very cool to see. Unfortunately, if you're an alien, you won't be able to see it because we will cover this to preserve the thermal properties of the instrument. <laughs> There we go. Why do I classify stuff, right? So I classify stuff uh, for Euclid specifically. We have very strict uh, laundry list of requirements coming from the quick lensing side because I work in all the photo Z. The quick lensing people are our customers. So they need us to maintain certain properties when it comes to the classification. But I also have to face the reality, right? There is missing data, there is wrong labels when you're doing supervised stuff, and there is uncertainties, there's too much data, and all of these kinds of things. So I've been <laughs> uh, occupying these guys up there, uh, trying to you know, come up with, with cool ways of uh, exploring the data and um, you know, trying to, to get reality out of all of the classifications uh, we are trying to do. Now, back in 2018, and uh, quite a few years before that, that, we started this exploration, always with, mind, uh, uh, with Euclid in mind, how to improve the photometric redshift, right? And if you're familiar with the Cosmos survey, you know that if you are able to separate the AGNs, and in that case, using X-rays, you can use a specialized library of templates to get the best photo Z you can for AGNs. So the idea was, why stop there? Let's go and try to do that for all of the galaxy populations we can imagine. Let's try to get the best photometric redshift for all of the sources without X-rays. We are not going to have deep X-rays for the entire sky, right? So, let's sing learning to the rescue, as we do. And the idea here was, okay, if you have a photometric survey, you don't even know you're looking at the galaxy. So, let's start by asking the question, is it a star or not, right? I like binary classifiers. <laughs> is it a star or not? Um, and then for the galaxies, we also ask the question, what kind of galaxy are you? Are you passive? Are you star-forming, starburst, AGN, or quasar? Where I make the distinction between the AGN of quasar, the quasar being the source that, where the emission is dominated by the central engine compared to the host galaxy. If I see a host galaxy mixed with the quasar, then I call that an AGN. I don't care about the image at this state. It's only the emission that I get in the photometry. And since we're there, we can also ask the question, can I identify photometric redshift outliers, right? This is a specific um, definition of an outlier. Spoiler alert, the answer is, eh, it's very hard, right? Because you can be an outlier for many reasons. Um, in this particular case, I, I, will, I had more false positives. So if you're ready to chop your sample, you can do it. Uh, and once you have all of these classifications and probabilities, because this is a random forest, our favorites, you can bring all of the probabilities together and slice and dice your sample, if you prefer a pure sample, if you prefer a complete sample, depending on what you're trying to achieve later. We applied that to the XXL survey, which is 50 square degrees, that has extensive coverage uh, in the X-rays from maximum Newton. And here, what I show is the probabilities, right? So this is the same flowchart, a bit larger so you can read it. 
Here I saw the probabilities. Red means practically 100% probability to be a star. So this is I minus uh, R1, 3.6 microns, G minus Z. So here you expect the stars, and yay, we find all of the stars in the proper place. Down here, you expect the quasars, uh, which is absolutely great. They separate themselves compared to the rest of the population. And by the way, these things you cannot see in a survey like Cosmos because it's too small, right? The two square degrees is not enough to see these beasts. You see a few, but here we have uh, many thousands. What you also see is that we can find passive galaxies because they are in this like little finger compared to the rest of the population. Everybody else is a mess, right? But we sort of expect that the, the, the emission between a star-forming galaxy and an AGN, they start to be, you know, sort of similar at some point. So AGNs tend to be all over the galaxy population, and that's the big problem of trying to identify them with supervised learning. Now, moving beyond uh, labels, we wanted to ask the question, how far can we go with unsupervised learning, right? We know labels can be wrong, and we can discuss later about that if you want. So we explore the idea of taking the same data set, exactly the same as I showed earlier, and reducing uh, the dimensionality of the data and try to do clustering in the reduced uh, parameter space. So here we started with PCA, and we wanted to use HDBSCAN as our cluster because it's, it's very good. The problem was uh, that if you start from too many colors, <laughs> about 200 colors, which were all color combinations between our data, HDBs can, cannot handle that. The dimensionality is way too high. So we needed to reduce the parameter space. And admittedly, this is quite redundant, right? 200 uh, dimensions from this color combination, you had a lot of redundancy. So we cheated a bit, and we asked Random Forest to give us the 30 most important features based from what we had learned from the supervised learning. However, that was also very high, and we had to reduce the dimensionality further. Um, and then we used PCA, right? Um, CRISPIN, you that you see up there, experimented by reducing the dimensionality to three, four, five, however many dimensions. And he found out that between three and four, it was a good compromise. So what I show here is the PCA space uh, in three dimensions. So you have like the, the three projections. And you see that the clustering works very well. So the three colors are galaxies, quasars, and stars. Uh, we have a little guy there that we didn't explore further. Maybe there is something interesting there to, to look into uh, in more details. But this seemed to be uh, rather, to, to work rather well. Um, and it, we indeed got um, a performance comparable to what we had with the supervised learning and ignoring the labels. So Evan says, I've been trying to explore different dimensionality reduction methods. We've heard a lot about UMPAP and a lot about TSE. Uh, we also explored supervised um, self-organizing maps. Uh, a word of caution, when you're doing this kind of work with the spectroscopic sample, it's as bad as doing supervised learning because everything looks so beautiful with the spectroscopic sample. Things are bright and clear. You don't have messy stuff. Don't trust that. <laughs> this, is, this is based on the spectroscopic sample. If you project the photometric sample, it will end up all over the place. You will end up creating bridges between the clusters. It becomes a mess, okay? And that's why I haven't, you know, uh, publish that and say, look, my cluster works. It doesn't. Um, TSN is even worse. So you map, you can project new data because you're learning um, the, the, the projection and you can uh, put new data on the map. TSN, you cannot do that. You need to recreate the map every time. And every time you do that, you end up with a different map. Okay. Uh, the self-organizing map, I have my doubts still. I'm, I'm trying to, you know, explore the, the details there. It's not necessarily the case that you know, it will give you all of the answers. We can talk about this later. Um, now, the next question we wanted to answer is, okay, we have uncertainties in the data. How can we take this into account? And we also have missing data. So I had Mayank play with that. That was his master thesis. We had a lot of fun during the pandemic. I saw him twice <laughs> during the entire year he was there. Uh, but anyway, it was good fun. And the idea there was, uh, let's try to force the network to learn in the presence of missing data. And to do that, we created our input layer uh, that took as input the photometric data and created the colors as part of the network. And what Mayank did there was to introduce a dropout layer very early on in the network, and we were just throwing away 30% of the data with every uh, iteration, which meant that 
the network was forced to not use all of our data at the same time. Uh, this is sort of the idea as you do with random forest, more or less, but you get to control your input a little bit more. You, you are in control of what you put inside. Um, and this can be absolutely anything. It could be a CNN, right? Which means you can do the same with images. Um, to get a probability out of this guy at the end, because we like our PDFs, you can indeed turn this into an ensemble of networks. Um, uh, and then I will show you immediately uh, how this works, the output works. I just want to point out that once you have this machinery in place, you can uh, do exploration of what features are the most important ones uh, to classify your sources between uh, stars and galaxies in the particular situation. And it turns out the infrared, as you would expect, if you mask these guys, you cannot tell if it's a galaxy or a star in this case. Now, we did something funny as well because the color is part of the network, which means we have weights there. So we, instead of taking one minus the other, as we do in astronomy, because it makes sense to us, we let the weight uh, be a free parameter and be learned during the, the classification. And lo and behold, it turns out that we are doing a good job. One minus the other is the best way to, um, to classify our sources. So just to show you how the PDS look like, and here on the top you have a galaxy, on the bottom you have a star. The SCDs are not going to tell you too much one versus the other. Um, here we have, if I didn't say that, I will say it now. If you take the photometry at face value, you have the red line. This is what uh, Mayan calls unaugmented photometry. Here, this guy would be classified as a galaxy, more or less. So zero is a star, one is, is not star. This star would be classified quite confidently as a star. Now, if we want to introduce the photometry, the photometric uncertainty in our classifier, we treat it as a Gaussian distribution. Our photometry is the mean, the uncertainty is the sigma, and we draw a thousand values out of that uh, um, realization, and we give that to our network. Uh, and then you create a PDF, you have the, the uncertainty of the data, you have the uncertainty of the ensemble, all of the uncertainties in the world, and you end up that this guy, we don't really know what it is which sort of makes sense in this case, right? Because the uncertainties, it's not very clear, but the uncertainties in the, the um, ultraviolet part are quite large. So the network gets a little bit confused. Is it really a star or not? Something else he explored that I found it very interesting, and I'm not uh, sure people discuss it very openly in the CS world, but I was very happy to see that Paco has played with the seeds a lot in the simulations, is the actual seed you, you choose for your network. Right? Because you need to make this choice in order to reproduce the network every time you, you uh, redo uh, the exercise. So if you only take into account the uncertainty in the measurements, you end up uh, the, accuracy, the accuracy in your, in your classifier, right? This is the spread you end up with just from the uncertainty in the data in this particular data set, of course. But if we simply play uh, with a random seed, you end up with a much uh, larger accuracy spread, which <laughs> was quite horrifying to see. Funnily enough, mine was extremely lucky. <laughs> the black line is the choice of random city he did, right? <laughs> so, and it was, it, was, it was very funny to see, like that. Right, uh, that was all of the uncertainty part, and now let's go very quickly to the labels and see a framework, not a method per se. This can be applied to your favorite classification method, and this is active learning. So instead of saying, I want a gazillion galaxies with perfect labels for all of them, you say, okay, I don't know very many things. I start from five randomly, and then I put the human in the loop so you can inject knowledge as you go, and you ask your human to classify uh, their labels, to assign labels to your sources as they go. And what uh, Grant uh, showed here is that you can reach the same accuracy in the star galaxy separation for this particular data set uh, when you have 24,000 sources or 50 sources. So he made this beautiful dashboard to help uh, whoever wants to, to play with these things. Uh, at this instance, you can use any scikit-learn classifier um, and you input your own catalog, right? This is still working on data. He, he is working on the morphology version of the same, uh, um, of the same uh, dashboard. So what you do is you actually see where the visited points are in your photometric space. And what happens every, at every step is you calculate the uncertainty of the model. So there is a query strategy in the background that you can pick and you can tweak and you can do everything you want, completely configurable. And every time your model will say, I have no idea what's happening in this 
part of the parameter space, I will propose a point from there. And this point is then given to the human, and you get to decide what label this source should be assigned. If you don't want it, or you don't know what it is, you can simply say ensure, you skip it, you go to the next. Because we give this to a human, you can give in uh, extra information that's not available for the entire data set, and you can have a more educated guess on the actual um, label of your source. So we can have web services like cutouts, radio stuff, or spectra if available, and, and so on and so forth. And you can visualize the input catalog and you get to choose which plots you put there. You can also put theoretical lines and all of the good stuff. Now in the last minute, a slide for Joe. Where is Joe? She's not here. <laughs> there she is. <laughs> So we, we, we're talking about ChatGPT uh, quite a lot. And I uh, say, so, well, <laughs> many years ago, I was saying to myself, I cannot possibly read all of these papers, right? So I want to have my own Jarvis to tell me about the new papers of the day. So instead of actually doing that, I did what I do best. I classified the papers. So ADS is the best thing in the world. I love it with passion. Uh, so. I have a hundred libraries <laughs> on ADS, and I classify the new papers of the day, so you know I keep track of them easily in my mind anyway uh, on, on how I want to use them. The problem is when you use when you want to use this library to write your proposal, whatever, you need one bib tech, right? Because otherwise it's a mess. So I sold that and I made a little uh, script that plays with the API from ADS that merges all of the libraries and creates this megalib <laughs> that mine at that point had about 6,000 uh, papers. Uh, no, I haven't read 6,000. Um, you can export this as a local bib file and you can also have it in your ADS profile, right? Uh, and what I also did later on is to assign a keyword in your uh, reference, the citation that you download, I signed the keyword based on the the name you have given to your library. So when you import it in Zotero, you can filter according to your keyword, not the junk keywords the journals make us use. Uh, now, <laughs> inspired by Joe is, can we use this to optimize our own uh, large uh, language model? Can we ask ADS people, where is just, can we ask ADS people to, no, start thinking in that direction and we have our own personalized Jarvis when we're looking to ADS. And I will stop there. Thank you. All right, questions for Soteria? I will go first. Um, so I am terrified of observations, that's why I'm a theorist. Uh, what, what keeps you going when source classification <laughs> is so difficult? It's fun, you know, it's fun. So I got over the terrifying part of the observations many years ago, so now you know, I'm embracing the, the messiness of them, but we have to do it, right? Oh, and a reminder, say your name before you ask your question. I'm Megan Tillman. So three weeks ago, I gave a talk in which I challenged the concept of classification and extragalactic astronomy at a very fundamental level, mm -hmm. in the sense that I fundamentally don't think galaxies fall in classes, mm -hmm. in the same sense that, uh, you know, in the sense that, tw just to, you heard this, but some people didn't, um, in the sense that the tools that we have are really designed around things that truly are classes in the way that shoes and chairs are actually different things, but a star-forming galaxy and a not-star-forming galaxy are on a continuum. So how do you feel that, there is a question here, um, how do you feel that um, these classification-based tools can be effectively made to heal, can be, made, can be brought under our power to work in a space where I don't think anyone in this room thinks that, you know, there are only, you know, <laughs> that there's a, there's a galaxy, true galaxy binary. There's obviously galaxy continua. Um, how do we be, bring those tools to heal, just sort of from a broad perspective, given that these tools were not built by us? So <laughs> it always goes down to the actual question you're trying to solve. There is no classifier to rule them all. Right. If you're looking for mergers, you go and find mergers. If you're looking for uh, quasars, you go and find quasars. You will notice maybe in the historical uh, <laughs> exploration that I showed here at the beginning when I did the supervised version and I split between the different classes of galaxies, this was meant for PhotoZ. 
if you don't have the correct class for photo Z and you have the correct redshift, you don't care at all, right? Um, the means justify the, the, the purpose, or the purpose justify the means. Um, when it comes to classification with application to Euclid, and that is the only thing I care about in this particular instance, what we want to define is a pure star sample and a pure galaxy sample, which means we want to get rid of stuff that are going to be problematic in the photometric redshift, which means quasars. And all happens, you know, to, to come together in a nice uh, way. So I don't want to classify galaxies in different subcategories for this particular application. We just want a good galaxy sample that will be used as input for the weak lensing analysis. I agree with you. Everything is in a continuum. I completely agree. But possibly we can have a separation between stars and galaxies. <laughs> Globular clusters will disagree, but uh, yeah, I started worrying about this recently. <laughs> So, uh, very nice talk. So, uh, maybe I didn't understand this. So, in FlexiNet, when you talk about this dropout layer that you put, this is, I guess, in, in, a, in a different, slightly way that the typical thing that we do, right? That when you do your typical fully connected layer, you do your activation and your dropout. So, in this case, you do something different. No, it's the same. Oh, it's the same. Okay. It's the same, but we do it very early instead of very late. But this is after a fully connected layer, or is it at the beginning, or? Uh... So. You have your input, which is the photometry. Mm -hmm. Then you create a fully connected layer to create the colors, and then you put the dropout later. Okay. Hi, um, this is Haley Bowden. Thank you for the absolutely fascinating talk. I have a question about the active learning dashboard. Um, is there a way, like, I guess, how do you represent the uncertainty in the classification? Like, do multiple people classify the same object and you can go from there? Or, uh, you know, the, you said they have different amounts of information for each object. Yes, yeah, yeah, fantastic work? question. So, not at the minute. The idea there is that instead of asking, sorry, Mike, a thousand uh, volunteers, you ask an expert. And the expert will have, you know, a higher weight, you know. So instead of, uh, you optimize the time of your human classifier, let's put it like that. So I can stay there and classify 50 sources one after the other and end up with a decent classifier at the end. Okay, that, yeah, that makes sense. But what if, uh, like, your expert is looking at it and they're like, I'm not sure whether this is, I guess you have the unsure button. We have the unsure is... button, yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, because they, sometimes, or often, the expert says, I don't want to classify that. <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> okay. It's too messy. I don't want it in my sample, right? So you can make this choice. Okay. Yeah. No, but you are, you're, I mean, you're perfectly right with your uh, questions here. And th this is part of the stuff Grant is exploring at the minute. It's not a unique path through your parameter space. There is no unique sample that will give you the best classifier at the end. And in fact, if you do it and if I do it, we end up with a completely different sample, but we end up with comparable accuracies, and that's okay. Thank you. We have time for about one more question. Anyone have anything etching? that they want to ask? Okay, if not, let's thank Saria again.